I'm Keith Cameron, and this is the course How the Internet Works. This is Hour 3, Section 4. IPv6 is the most important change to the Internet since the Internet had its origin. It's the most profound and far-reaching. The drivers for moving to IPv6 are primarily the address space. IPv4 has an address space of 2 to the 32nd, which is approximately 4.3 times 10 to the 9th addresses. Those addresses are exhausting. IPv6 has a address space of 2 to the 128th, or approximately 3.4 times 10 to the 38th. So there are 29 orders of magnitude more IPv6 addresses than there are IPv4. Virtually every grain of sand on the earth could have an IPv6 address to give you an idea of how large that number is. In addition to having a greatly expanded address field, IPv6 uses addresses a bit differently. There's no such allocation as a private address in IPv6. Rather, there are different classes of address. One class is link local and those are IPv6 addresses that are typically used within a local area network. There are global addresses which are equivalent to an IPv4 publicly routable address. Those are known globally. And then there are specialized classes such as Anycast and Scalable Multicast. As I said, IPv6 deployment is being driven by IPv4 address exhaust. Asia Pacific exhausted in 2011 and Europe exhausted in 2012. I started watching IPv6 more closely in about 2008 and the projections were that IPv4 addresses would exhaust in two to three years. That has been a moving target. At the end of 2012, the projection exhaust for the Americas, including North America, was 2014. So it hasn't converged all that quickly. In Asia Pacific and a bit in Europe, there was a dash at the end to acquire more addresses. That has not happened in the Americas. Mobility, that is the LTE, long-term evolution, or 4G mobility, is likely to lead IPv6 in the U.S. In fact, with the dramatic growth of mobile devices using IPv6, in some sense that may push the exhaust of IPv4 out further, although IPv6 will see significant inroads as LTE is deployed. Very important to understand, IPv6 was not designed to be backward compatible with IPv4 in the sense that IPv6 protocol stack will not process an IPv4 PDU directly. There is a mechanism called dual stack deployment, which I'll talk about in a subsequent slide. But rather, IPv6 in some sense is a clean break with IPv4, which means those two networks, IPv4 and v6, will coexist for decades. The adoption of IPv6 will take time and there's tremendous content and applications running on IPv4 and it's not even clear when the tipping point will happen, that is when IPv6 traffic would exceed IPv4. Right now IPv6 traffic in the Americas at least is only 1% of the traffic or maybe a little more. It is growing at a relatively high rate though, it's doubling about every year and so it is picking up momentum. There are multiple technologies for interworking between IPv4 and IPv6, and I'll discuss those during the course of this uh, section. IPv6 is much more than routing. All systems like DNS and route reflectors and DHCP are all affected by IPv6. Some of the important improvements IPv6 brings are for security and authentication that was badly needed, routing efficiency, even though routers have to process 128-bit addresses, we'll see that there are efficiencies in IPv6 which will maintain the latency performance of IPv4 without any real special changes to the routers. And finally, mobility. IPv6 has functions for mobility that are apart from the wireless mobility implementations that we see in mobile networks today.
This is a comparison of the two PDUs, an IPv4 datagram, which we've looked at before, and a, an IPv6 datagram. As we do a side-by-side -side comparison, we see that version number is still the first bits received in either PDU, and we would expect to see 4 for an IPv4 and 6 for an IPv6 in that field. The header length is missing from the IPv6 datagram because the header is a fixed size, as shown here. A new priority field replaces the type of service field. The priority field is 16 values, half of which are allocated to protocols like TCP that have end-to-end -end congestion control, and the other half devoted to higher priority messages which do not have congestion control. The thinking is that those protocols that have end-to-end -end congestion control can recover with end-to-end -end retransmission, whereas the higher priority messages would support services like voice over IP and live video streaming, and therefore would warrant a higher priority. There's a new field, a flow label. An internet flow is determined by the source address and destination address, and usually port numbers as well. The idea here is to keep all of the messages in a flow together and to use the flow level at the routers to quickly decide how to route the messages. Once a flow label is detected that is non-zero, information about that flow is cached in the routers, expediting the routing of subsequent packets that belong to that flow. There's no total length field, there is a payload length field. Since the header length is fixed, then the payload length plus the header length would determine the overall length of the PDU. A new field, next header. Because the IPv6 datagram is of a fixed header length, there are multiple headers that can be added to PDU. These additional headers can do anything from identify TCP or UDP, which is what we have in IPv4, but also issues like fragmentation are handled with an extension header, as well as authentication and a notification that this message is a special ICMP type, ICMP version 6. The only other fields in the header are the source and destination address. And because they're 128 bits, we have four 32-bit datagram words associated with each of those addresses. There's no longer an options field with the associated padding because options are handled via the extension headers that I've shown here. Now let's take a look at dual stack operation. Dual stack is a little bit misleading because the parts of the stack that are affected are the IP layer. We said earlier that one of the benefits of the OSI model is that the independent layers of the stack can be replaced without affecting the entire operation of the stack. And this is a case in point. Here I've shown client host, a router, and a server host, and I've implemented IPv6 on all of the elements as well as the existing IPv4. And we see that IPv6 and IPv4 are side by side, and it's really up to the upper layer protocol, TCP in this case, and the lower layer protocol, Ethernet, to find the right version of the IP protocol to enter work with on any particular packet. As I said, the TCP and link layer protocols are largely unaffected, but no doubt there will be some changes to the north and southbound interfaces as a result of introducing IPv6 with new options. The other change that comes with IPv6 is each physical layer interface, here and here, is going to have multiple IP addresses. At least one IP address was associated in IPv4, and in some cases more, but with IPv6, there are new addresses that come. Not only is there uh, the difference between IPv6 and IPv4 link layer addresses, but IPv6 brings with it generally two addresses as a minimum, the link local address, 
and the global address. The link local address is automatically discovered via a dialog between all of its connected neighbors. The global address is uh, assigned uh, typically via DHCP version 6. We can expect our DNS servers to change because the records that are used by IPv6 are called quad A records as opposed to the A records used by IPv4 and uh, DHCP will change as well. There are uh, some URLs that will have multiple records, IPv6 and IPv4, so when a client host uh, makes a query to the DNS, it may get more than one record back, a v4 and a v6 or a quad A record. It'll be up to the client host to decide which of those two IP versions to use, and that'll be determined by the interfaces that are present on the host as well as any other considerations the resolver uses to decide which network to use. Once the decision's made, then TCP would forward the a TCP segment or a service data unit to the IP version of choice, and then the PDU or datagram would be formulated by that version and passed on to Ethernet. Many other systems are affected by dual stack operation and the conversion to IPv6. The route reflectors in the networks will have to change. Those are typically tier one and tier two networks that are of scale. And so the route tables will have to incorporate IPv6 routes as well as IPv4. Firewalls for IPv6 will have to be adopted because clearly the rules that are used for IPv4 uh, won't apply, and so two sets of firewalls will have to be maintained, one for IPv4 and one for IPv6. And then, of course, the uh, network management systems have to be updated. The real important point of dual stack operation is that over one physical layer interface, you can get two different versions of IP messages, the v version 4 and version 6. And then it'll be up to Ethernet to look at that version number in the first few bits of the IP datagram and decide which layer of the protocol to hand it to. Now I want to go back to the very first slide I showed in the course, the network of networks that compose the internet and discuss how the introduction of IPv6 is going to affect those networks. Our network today is uh, almost entirely IPv4 with some exceptions. The notable exception is really LTE that's being introduced into the radio network. That introduction started in 2011 and is accelerating and by 2016 will be largely complete. The pivotal point in that introduction is the introduction of voice over LTE which is a voice over IP protocol. There are two to 300 million devices easily that are wireless in the network today. And I, the use of private IP addresses is at its end. So the LTE standards body, 3GPP, specified that IPv6 was the primary IP version to be used in LTE and only allowed IPv4 for transition. So we can expect a couple of hundred million IPv6 capable devices to turn up over the next several years. That will be the impetus for IPv6 content. The mobile network and the mobile operators or will be IPv6 capable and tier 1 operators are already running dual stack operation on their edge routers and the core of the tier 1 networks multi protocol label switching is IP version agnostic which means it can carry IPv6 as well as IPv4 providing those other systems I mentioned like uh, route reflectors and the management systems are updated so in short order, we can expect to see IPv6 going end-to-end -end from mobile networks into IPv6 content. 
IPv6 content will be slower to turn up. In the interim, the mobile operators will continue to provide IPv4 support by giving mobile devices both a static or permanently assigned IPv6 address as well as a dynamic or temporary IPv4 address when they access uh, IPv4 content. So there will be two methods of operation. One will be native IPv6 all the way to IPv6 content and the other will be a dynamic and it will be done via PAT, that is a port address translation. It is likely that services will emerge that are native IPv6 that will, will be superior to the PAT operation of IPv4. When that happens, then we should see IPv6 content sites turn up much more quickly. For the wireline side of the world, it's IPv4 today. The story is quite different. In the legacy wireline networks, the story is mixed, uh, particularly if we look at the DOCSIS cable networks, that is the most current release of the cable technology, and some of the more recent DSL technologies are IPv6 capable natively, which means IPv6 clients can turn up in the home and operating systems that are modern from Windows Vista, Windows 7, Windows 8, uh, Linux, and many other operating systems are already IPv6 capable. And with that combination of an IPv6 capable access network and the home network, uh, then it is possible to access IPv6 content. There are legacy wireline systems. Um, ADSL is one of them that will not be converting to IPv6. Uh, the technology is just not suited for that. But the carriers can implement technologies that allow IPv6 to be tunneled over IPv4 again to IPv6 content. So we can expect that as IPv6 content becomes available, it can be either reached natively or uh, via tunnels. I'll conclude the course with a last suggested reading list. I hope you've enjoyed the course as much as I've enjoyed preparing it.